Hello and welcome back to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelizer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, and this is my co-host and colleague, Sam. Hi, this is Sam Wong, neuroscience professor and uh, proprietor of the Princeton Election Consortium. So the polls have been pretty stunning in the last few weeks, really in the last few days. If they're to be believed, Sam, we're seeing one of the worst political implosions uh, in recent history, one that might make historians head spins uh, in, in, in future years. Every worst case scenario for Republicans seems to be coming true. Trump is losing in some uh, battleground states, he's losing in Republican states, and he's certainly not, according to the polls, gonna win in any blue states. Uh, polls have been with us for a long time. There were straw polls in the 19th century that were not very accurate. And modern polling emerged in the 1930s and 1940s. There are many famous moments with polls that are etched in our historical memory. There was a famous straw poll in 1936 in the Literary Digest that said, uh, Al Landon would defeat FDR in a landslide election, which is not what happened. Uh, 1948 is the most famous example where the polls had the Republican Thomas Dewey ahead of President Harry Truman, who was running for re-election in September, which led to the famous newspaper headline, which Truman proudly held over his head following his victory that said, Dewey defeats Truman. We stopped polling a few weeks too soon, one of the Gallups would later admit. And we still have examples where polls seem to be off or giving us the wrong information. In 2008, all the polls said Barack Obama would beat Hillary Clinton in the New Hampshire primary. And there were many polls during the Republican primaries this year that seemed to be off the mark. So uh, people are often frustrated trying to figure out how to interpret these polls. Uh, are people telling the truth in polls? There's so many polls from different sources. How do you make sense of them in 2016? So with you as the co-host of this podcast, we thought it was a perfect opportunity, Sam, to try to make sense of polls and figure out uh, how do we understand them? How do we best interpret them? So maybe we can start with just a basic question of what is a poll? Well, let's see. So. Um... Nothing warms my heart more than uh, drilling into the nerdy details of uh, of understanding polls. So I think a lot of people know already that polls are um, structured interviews where you try to pick a sample that's representative of the, of the population. That's pretty important because if you don't, you're doing something more like a focus group. And so what you do is you pick people at random that are supposed to be representative of the voting population. And then you ask them some questions. You hope they pick up the phone or answer your email or what have you. And then you take the numbers that you get and you um, and you figure out whether it's representative. And you, if not, then you have to do a correction to get it to be representative of real voters. And then you report that out. And uh, pollsters are pretty professional these days. I, I have to interject here that uh, as a non-historian, the way I would look at this is that at times like this, losing campaigns always like to point at the spotty history of old polls. And for instance, uh, Newt Gingrich, who if it people recall, has uh, also has a PhD in history, has been talking it up over the last week about uh, the Dewey-Truman race. Even though we hear about these famous failures, I think the thing to remember is that polling errors have gotten smaller and smaller, and pollsters have been getting better at their craft and keeping up with technology. So uh, it's um, if, if you hear somebody talking about polling errors or polling failures, uh, probably the one thing you can say for sure is that their side is not ahead. And then related to that is is one of the issues that does come up that's different than just saying polls are often off the mark is that changes in technology make polling more difficult. So you often hear what's going to happen now that uh, telephones, landline telephones are gone and uh, are polls going to be as accurate in the age of the smartphone? Uh, is is there a new challenge that pollsters face, or or can we have just as good polling in the age uh, where landlines are pretty much pretty much gone from most homes? Well, let's see. So, keep in mind, just to return to a quantitative point, I like to think of these things in terms of specific numbers. So, if you look at the Dewey Truman failure, 
Uh, that was a poll, as you said, that uh, polls were stopped a few weeks before the election. And the error there was something like, if I recall correctly, 9 to 19 points. The Literary Digest poll of 1936 that missed Franklin Rose Roosevelt's re-election was similarly a pretty large error. So these days, when we think about a polling error, we have several luxuries. The first luxury is that there are lots of pollsters now, and so it's possible to aggregate them, put together multiple polls. Once you aggregate them, the polling error typically is, uh, for a general election, is only a few points for a primary or some other kind of election where only you know smaller numbers of people vote. In those cases, in sort of specialized elections, errors tend to be somewhat larger. So, um, so the first thing is that the bottom line is that uh, polls seem to do pretty well. Again, being off by only a few points if you aggregate them properly. But at, in response to your thoughts, pollsters are professionals. They have a professional society. They go to conferences. I've never been to one. That would be, you know, nerd heaven for me. But um, but they're constantly experimenting with new methods. As far as I can tell, as an outsider to that field, they seem to be having a really good time in their profession because they have all kinds of technical challenges. They're using the internet, they're using other kinds of methods of reaching voters. Um, they're coming up with clever ways of asking questions, right? So they're coming up with interesting ways of, of breaking down the, the electorate. They're doing a lot of experiments, whether it be cell phones, email, what have you. They're doing a lot to, uh, to explore the limits of, of their craft. And so I think that when people talk about polling being in crisis, I don't know. I mean, as opposed to what field? I mean, you know, I, I don't use a manual typewriter when I write my papers. Uh, and yet I, I think that, I don't know, word processing technology seems okay. So you're overall, you're uh, pretty comfortable that polling has been doing well, that some of the exceptional moments that are famous uh, are exceptional moments. Generally, that polls give us a pretty good read of where the electorate is and that polling is getting better, not worse. And some of these challenges that we're talking about, such as how do you reach people with cell phones are not as significant uh, or devastating as some people might suggest, that uh, polling is developing, evolving, and, and getting around some of these challenges. The term though you mentioned, which many people don't know, I think, uh, what it is, even though it's probably basic for you, is what does it mean to aggregate Polls. What are you doing when you yes. aggregate polls? Right. That is a great question. So again, I'm, I'm not an expert pollster, so I don't really do a lot of the things that they do. So each of these pollsters has his or her own expertise. And they do things like they, they try to weight their sample to make sure it has the right fraction of Republicans and Democrats or the right num number of uh, uh, older and younger voters. Uh, usually they don't weight by party, but they do weight by age or sex. And so they each have their own technical standards, and those technical standards aren't the same because each pollster has its own thoughts about what's really important. So it's kind of like the wisdom of crowds, the way that we can use electronic markets or even real markets to, uh, to understand what the value of a stock is or the value of a candidate in a betting market. Uh, aggregating polls consists of taking a bunch of polls and not relying on any one, but relying on the whole field, uh, the, the whole s set of samples that pollsters have taken, the whole set of methods and approaches they have, and saying that, okay, any individual poll might be off, but if we take a group of polls, then that group of polls might be, is going to be more accurate than any single poll. And so one can do a very simple thing that doesn't even require arithmetic. I mean, this is really simple stuff. You can just take the median of a group of polls and and see what the median tells us. So uh, shall I maybe give an example? Yeah, let walk people through that. I think it'd be helpful. Okay, so for example, if I look over at, uh, at the Huffington Post, which is the source of polling data that, uh, that the Princeton Election Consortium uses, and I ask a question like, okay, let's see. So if you look at the most recent polling for the national uh, general election, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, uh, the last three surveys that they have uh, were taken between August 8th and August 14th, and they're from UPI, Morning Consult, and NBC. And these three surveys show Hillary Clinton up by seven points, 51 to 44, mm -hmm. uh, up by, at Morning Consult, 44 to 37, and NBC up 50 to 41. So these are pretty different numbers. And the first thought would be, gosh, this is confusing. Why are you inundating me with all these numbers? So when I look at numbers like this, I, I look to, for a simple way to simplify them. So I say, okay, first off, they seem to have pretty different approaches to um, approaching undecided voters. But let's say the UPI survey has Hillary Clinton up by seven points, 
right. Morning Consult has Hillary up by seven points, and NBC has Hillary Clinton up by nine points. And so the first thing I do is I just take the median. And I, what the median is, is I take these margins, seven, seven, and nine, I put them in order, and I take the middle one, which mm -hmm. is seven. And so right. I say, okay, well, the median is apparently that Hillary Clinton is up by 7%. And at this point, I now am not going to be all that persuaded by, say, a Rasmussen poll saying that she's only up by three. And mm -hmm. I've, if I phone, if I want to find one where Donald Trump is ahead, well, I have to go back a long time to find one of those. But, but you know, here's another one saying that Hillary Clinton's up by 13. I'm pretty sure both of those are wrong. Uh, I'm reasonably confident from looking at this data that she's probably up by about seven percentage points right now in national surveys. And so, yeah, so just taking um, the median of a, of a few polls um, can really get rid of the noise and get you calmed down if you, uh, depending on what, who you favor. It, it leads to far less drama, but basically if you just take multiple polls and take the median, that kind of leads a person to think that there's not much change happening at any given moment in time, which but is part, true. I mean, but part of it then is a clash. Uh, journalists like the drama and the drama makes the good story. So if you follow the news, there's always a new poll that uh, seems to change the direction of the race or give you surprising information or go against the conventional wisdom. So what you're saying in terms of how to look at polls and how to get around the noise that some people say exists with all the polls uh, clashes a bit with how journalists might want to interpret this data. I mean, is that is that wrong, uh, or do you think uh, there's some of that in in the modern media? Yeah, the way I would, I think that's right. I, the way I would put it is that uh, you know we we think about journalists as writing a first draft of history, and then you know, and and then in your profession, you know, we've got the actual draft of history. In either case, what people are looking for is the human story, and the human story involves exceptions from the norm, right? It's really interesting right. when something unusual happens. When the Republican Party implodes, gosh, that's interesting. When uh, uh, when something extreme happens at one of the conventions, we, we look for extreme events to happen. In the news, when something unusual happens, like, I don't know, a boat gets stranded or something, then you write about that. But actually, most boats don't get stranded. So, <laughs> in the, right? It's true. Right. No, no, no. Uh, You're right. Yeah. And, so, um, and so, in polling, this is a statistical question, and this is a funny case because it goes, interpreting statistical data correctly goes, probably goes against the instincts of journalists, namely, they want to report the unusual event. And so if a poll came out today showing that, say, the race was essentially tied, mm -hmm. um, there are two entities that you can count on to, um, to report that. One would be certain reporters who like to report sin single polls, and, and the other is obviously the Trump campaign. Um, and so th there's this tendency to report events that surprise us and go against the grain. And I think it's, um, it's an impulse that is okay for special stories like plane wrecks or boat wrecks or what have you. Uh, but when it comes to polling data, uh, it would be far better practice to find some way to, to convey the general gist of what all the polls are saying. Okay, so we have this clash. We have what seems to be your very reasonable method of uh, getting a sense of where the nation is on this big question of who the next president can be. So let me go back, though, to potential issues in uh, the polls that we're seeing. Another, a different than the landline cell phone issue, is are people telling the truth in this particular election? Are there people who support Donald Trump and will vote for him who are not telling pollsters this. Uh, there's probably not a lot of people who are saying the opposite, but some imagine that everyone isn't willing to admit that they might be a Trump supporter. Is there any reason to think this could not be true, but true to any significant extent, that it would actually affect the data? Or when we look at the aggregate, numbers, do we still have a pretty good sense and clean that out of the of the data? Well, let's see. So let's just take a step back and make brief note of the fact that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are two of the most famous people on the planet right now. <laughs> and uh, they, they and they were that famous before the presidential race started. So to some extent, this is a sort of a surreal experience for people living outside the United States or in the, you know, in, in, on the other side of the world, because if they had to name people in the United States, these would be among the few people they could name spontaneously. And that was before the campaign started. So turns out, as far as I can tell, I, I don't know about you, but most people I know have an opinion about these people. Yeah. Now, that having been said, uh, you're referring to a thing that uh, 
polling people and uh, political scientists have called the Bradley effect, where Tom Bradley, who is a, a black man who was running for mayor of Los Angeles, uh, I think it was his uh, mayor's run, or maybe it was his for higher office, I can't remember. But anyway, um, the phenomenon was that when live callers called people to ask them who they'd vote for, they got a certain fraction of the vote for Tom Bradley, for Mayor Bradley, mm -hmm. and then he ended up doing worse than that. And so the, uh, the, the conclusion, this is 30 years ago, the conclusion from that was that um, evidently people wouldn't quite say that they were unwilling to vote for a black guy. So the suggestion is that maybe there's that feeling uh, in some other form for Donald Trump that in fact it's socially unacceptable to, uh, to support Trump and so therefore uh, one would perhaps be unwilling to say so. So there's a few reasons why that's probably not true. Uh, one reason is that um, in live caller interviews and in automated interviews where you push a button on your phone to say who you like, yeah. uh, Trump does similarly. Another reason is that um, in the primaries, Trump performed overall uh, within a few percentage points of how he was doing in the polls. And so it looked like the polls in the primaries uh, this year, with one or two exceptions, basically did a good job of capturing Trump's support. So I, I think that this is probably at some level, um, not to point a finger at the news media, but uh, news media tend to be in places that are pretty cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. I saw an interesting piece a while ago by Daniel Okrent, who was the ombudsman of the New York Times, who pointed out that it wasn't that newsrooms were liberal, it was that they were in urban places that were cosmopolitan and liked diversity of opinion and thought that that was a general value. And so I think there's this general tendency in newsrooms to find Trump's thinking pretty alien. And so to, to them, maybe they think that somehow support for Trump is shameful. But I don't know, if you go to Wyoming or Alabama or what have you, um, I think there's a lot of people who like Trump. So I, I, I don't, you know, both the evidence uh, and I think the culture of media uh, both suggest that this fear of, uh, of a Trump effect in polling is probably overblown. I think the polls are pretty dead on. That's that's probably comforting for people, uh, and I don't mean Trump supporters versus Trump opponents, but I, I, I do think not everyone is as confident with polls as you are. Yeah, but you mean uh, like comforting to someone who, to for people who like empirical evidence. So, right. Yeah, so what I'm right. saying is the entire field of yeah. polling is probably not wrong because, you know, they're, they're actually, when they are wrong, they're not wrong by a lot, and I think this is probably going to be just in line with that. And the issue, the other issue that comes up is is just bias in individual polls, uh, which is something that's often yeah. discussed. Is that a big problem or how does that work? I think if you rely on only one pollster, that's going to be a problem. I mean, there are pollsters like Rasmussen and to a lesser extent Gravis that are known to have a bias to favor the Republican candidate. Uh, there are other pollsters like, uh, I'm just looking at the recent data, it looks like Monmouth University, at least for now, seems to have some lean towards uh, the Democratic candidate. Um, some of that is just statistical fluctuation. And so I think it's easy for people. Um, there's this phenomenon in psychology. What does that mean? What do you mean like a lean toward the can uh, on purpose or? Uh, not on purpose. Like they say, you know, we you know, they have to make guesses about what's going to happen. So like a typical example of how a pollster fails is in midterm elections, pollsters do far worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so pollsters were a, a bit off two years ago in 2014 and so missed uh, several Senate races on average. And the reason was they had to take a guess as to turnout. And mm -hmm. 2014, two years ago, was the lowest turnout in 60 years, in 70 mm -hmm. years. I think the last time turnout was that low was during World War II and a whole bunch of people were off in the Pacific Ocean and, in, and, and heading off to Europe to go fight a war. And so anyway, so two years ago, there was no war, but yet turnout was at historic lows. Uh, and pollsters didn't do so good, such a good job, and that's because they had to guess who was going to vote. Um, it's a little bit easier in a presidential year because to first order in a presidential year, you know, kind of everybody votes. Uh, but they still have to make guesses about how many young people are going to vote, how many old people are going to vote. And those guesses, I mean, they're, not, they're more than guesses. They're informed estimates. But each pollster is going to make its own estimates, and that means that each pollster is going to come up with a slightly different result. On top of that, there's statistical fluctuation. So if you draw, you know, whatever, um, if you flip a coin, you're not always, you're, you're almost never going to get an exact equal number of heads and tails. And so statistically, these polls are going to vary. And so there are these things that happen in polls that, um, that mean that one should usually be careful about interpreting a single poll, even if pollsters have no intentional bias, uh, they tend to have individual biases. And, you know, a complicated approach is to start trying to correct for those biases. I think that's a mistake because generally speaking, you're going to look for biases that um, that go against what you might prefer to be the case. Uh, 
right? So if you have a if you're a Democrat or a Republican, then you want a, a particular result, and so you're going to reject some of these pollsters. I, I think my, when I, the way I do it, I just don't reject pollsters. I, my feeling is, if they appear to be an honest broker, then I just accept all the data, and I think that it tends to give more accurate results. And you think so? Once you aggregate this, you'll get even if there's some messiness in a few of them, you still get overall a pretty good picture of where things are. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, it's like uh, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to, let's say you're, uh, I don't know, let's pick an example. Let's say you're you're watching your weight and you weigh yourself three times. What what you should not do is weigh yourself three times and then take the measurement that is most favorable to you. Uh, you know, that would be tempting, uh, but yeah. it would be better to. I don't know, use a few scales, weigh yourself a few times, and then take the middle measurement. And, uh, and I think it's the same way with pollsters, that, um, that it's better not to get wrapped up too much in any individual poll. And then you said that pollsters use informed estimates. What does that mean? Well, okay, an example of an informed estimate is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in the Democratic primaries, uh, we, uh, a pollster might like to know what the outcome is going to be in Colorado, and they call a bunch of people, and they discover that when they call phones, whether landlines or mobiles, they discover that about uh, a half of their sample is people over 65. Mm -hmm. And then they look at the demographics, and they look at the voter rolls, and ask, okay, how, what fraction of people in Colorado actually vote? Are they who are, you know, are, are over 65? And they look and they say, oh, it turns out that only a quarter of people uh, in Colorado are over 65 who vote or sorry, a quarter of voters in Colorado are, are over 65. And they say, well, looks like we have an overcounting of them by a factor of two. So maybe we should only count these respondents half each. Mm -hmm. And and so if they do that over and over again with more, you know, with more quantitative weights, I gave a simple example. They do that uh, to various demographics. Uh, another example might be, well, if, uh, if a different number of men and women vote uh, or respond to the poll, if a different number of men and women respond to the poll, and we're pretty sure that equal numbers of men and women are going to vote, then what we should do is count them so that all the men together count equally to all the women and to not rely on the fact that the sample was slightly uh, and to to correct for the fact that the sample is not entirely balanced. And so they have to do things like that. It is hardly ever the case that a pollster reports just who picked up the phone and just reports that number unthinkingly. They They apply a layer of professional expertise to any number that you see. Uh, and, you know, people who are polling nerds will typically get into what are called the cross tabs, where they drill into all the details of a poll uh, mm -hmm. and start chewing over those details. And, and I think using cross tabs to be skeptical of a poll is probably not the right use of a cross tab. You know, I have one other really basic question I realize I don't know at this point, and we talked a little bit about it, but how are they doing polls now? How are they reaching people? to get all this information? Uh, let's see, so the traditional way is to call landlines. Uh, yeah. As you pointed out, so, um, a lot of households don't have landlines now. Right. Uh, another thing is something called, um, the technical term in the field is dual frame sampling. And there are all these that? all this technical lingo. So te dual frame sampling is, uh, they, they try to reach people two different ways, say by landline and by mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And then they find a way to combine those samples to get a, a broader picture of the, uh, the audience. For instance, just to pick an example, um, Nevada, has um, a high fraction of people who have just moved to the state or who are about to move out. And so Nevada is a really hard place to poll. And so pollsters have to figure out how to reach people in Nevada. It's tough. Uh, lots of uh, mobile voters. Another thing in Nevada is um, high Hispanic population. Mm -hmm. And uh, traditionally, pollsters seem to have difficulty reaching Hispanic populations, um, you know, maybe because of language, maybe for other reasons. But that's tough for them. And so they, they'll do that. A real innovator in polling is YouGov, and there's some other pollsters who are using internet-based samples. So they uh, email people and say, will you do this poll? Well, that's one way of doing it. So one, yeah. like there's this extreme version where what you do is you get a group of people by email and you say, let's just follow you over time and recontact you over and over again. Yeah. But another way of doing it would be, for instance, um, a way it could be done, for instance, would be uh, using a Google ad. So you usually, you know, most people use Google now, and you can imagine an ad popping up in your browser saying, hey, would you like to answer this? And then, um, and then getting basically a random sample that's like calling people, except you're reaching people through internet. So pollsters have a lot of different ways of doing this. And then, they have, then they're faced with the problem of, as I said, how to convert the answers into a fair sample. And so there are several layers of it. And, uh, and one layer is reaching people any way you can. And another layer is uh, doing something rational with the answers that you get according to rules that you set out in advance to, uh, to come up with a fair uh, and balanced picture.
and polling's never done, I assume it's just not efficient, but it's never done in person. I don't think that it's done in person. The exception to that is exit polls, right. uh, which we see on election night. Uh, ironically, exit polls actually don't do so well. And I think a dirty secret of exit polls, people often talk about exit polls being wrong. Exit polls are also weighted, and if I understand the process correctly, they are weighted according to what the exit pollsters think is going to be the outcome that evening. Mm -hmm. uh, people with clipboards standing outside polling stations will, will ask questions, but that also has biases because not everybody wants to talk to somebody with a clipboard. And so exit polls have to be corrected. And they actually, ironically, are more prone to error than poll aggregates. If you want to know what's going to happen in an election, poll aggregates are better than exit polls. So for instance, on election night four years ago and also eight years ago in Virginia, uh, I had much better information about uh, what was going to happen in that presidential race than anybody watching TV, anybody watching on election night, because polls before the election did a great job of reaching people throughout the state of Virginia. But exit polls and also early returns, right? Another example yeah. where you might think that would be um, good, that's like a direct count. But both of those were biased and they were biased towards the Republican side because different parts of Virginia report back at different rates. So it's kind of ironic that, that opinion polls that come in for a lot of criticism in the aggregate are actually more accurate than, than exit polls and even more accurate than vote counting itself until the vote counting is finished. So that, that's why I think opinion polls are pretty good. Before we wrap up, I have to ask my weekly question of what the, what the most interesting poll that you've seen this week, even though we're now looking at an individual poll and I realize it's the wrong question, uh, but what's, what's the most interesting data that you've seen in the last few days? Well, I have to say I'm getting a little bit saturated on, uh, on top line numbers of uh, Clinton versus Trump, and I'm even getting saturated on you know swing state and, and red state polls. I think that all that stuff aggregated the way I do at election.princeton.edu uh, I just follow that, and I. But you know, things seem to be ramping towards a pretty strong lead. So I'm now getting really fascinated by down ticket uh, races. Uh, mm -hmm. Congress, as we talked about before, is in the balance, and I noticed something interesting in the generic congressional poll, which I've mentioned before, in the generic congressional survey, um, where people are asked, "Do you prefer the Democratic or the Republican candidate for Congress?" Even though it doesn't name specific district candidates, it still does a pretty good job of capturing that. Uh, the first thing that captured my attention is that in the last three gen uh, generic congressional polls in the uh, Huffington Post database, the median result is the Democrat, uh, Democrats ahead by 6%. But what caught my eye as I was going over it is one of these other questions. And this is one way that pollsters can be interesting. They, uh, they start thinking of other questions. But anyway, this, this one is something that's, that's part of questions and often doesn't get talked about when people cover polls. This is the undecided voter question. And it mm -hmm. turns out in the last three surveys, a median of 19% of voters are undecided about which way they're going to go. And that's interesting because if Democrats are ahead by six points, that might be good for them. But with 19% of voters undecided, that is a lot of undecided voters. And if they break 60-40 in either, either direction, that could end up meaning um, a narrow Democratic win at the congressional level, which would probably keep Republicans in control. Or it could lead to, say, a, a 10-point Democratic win nationwide, which would almost certainly put uh, Congress in the hands of the Democrats uh, after, um, after the election. So I, I'm kind of interested in this undecided voter number. I think it's, you know, it, it declines as the election gets closer. Uh, but I feel like there's a lot of suspense at that level. And, uh, and, and that's, an, that's a lot of undecided voters. And that's a big story. I mean, we've talked about that in the past, but, you know, people focus on the presidential race, but really what's going to have such a big effect is uh, weather control changes in Congress, how narrow the uh, majority is of whichever party is controlling it, given the environment we face, that's really going to determine what kind of policy options are available. But that wraps up our episode. Uh, Sam and I, we're going to take a little break and refresh our minds, uh, but we'll be back soon with more discussions about the election. So thanks for joining us and look forward to having you again on Politics and Polls, everyone. Take care, everyone.